Hello, uh, welcome to this webinar uh, uh, organized by the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies or WIIW. Uh, we take the occasion of, uh, uh, of a commemoration of 30 years since the dissolution of uh, the Soviet Union or the USSR to reflect on uh, this uh, rather historic momentous event uh, with a very uh, impressive panel, uh, which you will uh, be able to hear. My name is Michael Landesmann. I work at the Vienna Institute. I've been its scientific director for many years. And um, this, uh, we, we take the opportunity actually to reflect on also how our analytical tools have developed to study these processes. Um, so what have we learned from uh, the very heterogeneous and differentiated uh, trajectories which uh, countries um, uh, which countries in the region uh, have uh, followed and i think we must say and probably concede as economists that we started off in 1989 with a very impoverished uh, analytical framework to and uh, our advice was rather courageous and probably you might say uh, even too courageous <laughs> what we tried to uh, to, the, to to support uh, policy making in this period and i think over time only over time we uh, were able to uh, understand the complexity of uh, the political economic structures and the processes which were driving these differentiated developments and which in a sense led to both successes and failures which we probably were not able to predict in advance and probably even this binary classification uh, success or failure is inappropriate. Yeah, So I won't uh, give a long introduction to this because that is the function of <laughs> our speakers, <laughs> uh, but um, I think uh, probably the, uh, uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have one of the pe people who were very instrumental to widen our approach to study um, uh, these uh, developments, uh, Sergei Gurujev, who will start us off. Um, it's uh, very clear that um, uh, that uh, the analysis, uh, although it is historically relevant, is still very relevant also for today's developments. Uh, we can see heterogene heterogeneous trajectories following still uh, all the transition economies, and by the way, also non-transition economies, <laughs> if you think about uh, also Western European economies. Uh, but, uh, and I think uh, if you read um, uh, Sergei Gurjev's uh, work uh, more recently, and he's very prolific also in the <laughs> recent period, you can see that he try, uh, tries to draw lessons uh, also to study uh, developments within, uh, uh, within the European Union. And he has a big project which he's directing on populism. Uh, he uh, uh, he's just now, I think, going to be publish uh, uh, a book by Princeton University Pre Press with uh, Daniel Treisman uh, on uh, the changing face of tyranny in the 21st century. And before that, obviously, it uh, develops a framework to study moves towards authoritarianism. And one can also see in his work that he's very interested in China and what lessons can be learned from a comparative analysis of developments in China, uh, Russia, etc. In fact, we are uh, probably in the uh, as we go along, we are going to um, uh, to uh, upload some of the references, which are very interesting. Uh, one uh, reference which I found particularly interesting is a long paper in the Journal of Economic Literature, Gorbachev versus Denk, uh, to try to analyze in detail the developments uh, in the Gorbachev period and uh, following that and compare it with the uh, reform process in China. And I think obviously this is extremely interesting. Uh, so uh, overall, we have really the person to uh, guide us on uh, analyzing uh, uh, developments following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, probably it hardly needs an introduction. Uh, uh, Sergei Gurjev was uh, a rector of uh, the prime uh, uh, graduate uh, institution for economic studies, the High School of Economics in Moscow for quite a number of years. In fact, he not only studies uh, complex transition processes, but also experienced it in a personal capacity. So he moved in 2000, 2013 uh, to Paris, where he's now professor at uh, Sciences Po. And uh, after three years, moved <laughs> to London for a three-year stint as a chief economist of the EBRD. Uh, 
uh, he's uh, also extremely involved in the big research agenda on institutional and political economic uh, uh, research, uh, was president of the Society for Institutional and Organizational Economics, uh, very active in the International Economic Association, etc. Uh, let me introduce uh, the second uh, pa panelist, or one, <laughs> uh, who is um, Timothy Milovanov um, from uh, the Kiev uh, School of Economics, but also a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. So he must be a commuter, uh, a wide-ranging commuter <laughs> uh, in the current circumstances. Um, he is a, a very distinguished uh, economic theorist and mathematical economist, at least for us as economists, this is probably the most important <laughs> part of his career, with publications in uh, really all the prime journals, American Economic Review, Journal of Economic Theory, Journal of Mathematical Economics, Review Economic Studies, etc. Yeah? By the way, the same, of course, applies to Sergei, <laughs> whom I didn't uh, speak about all uh, the prominent uh, publications, but uh, probably less um, uh, typical for a mathematical economist, uh, an expert on game theory, on contract theory, on institutional design theory. He also uh, was very involved in uh, the reform processes, uh, starting with what I think for any analyst of Ukraine is a very, very important uh, um, uh, important institutional uh, uh, innovation. Uh, similarly to Vox EU, there's in Vox Ukraine, and I think uh, together with colleagues, uh, uh, Timothy uh, was founding that uh, Vox Ukraine website, which has, has very up to date and objective uh, analysis of uh, developments in Ukraine. Uh, uh, while on the policy side, <laughs> after the uh, a revolution uh, of dignity, as it was called, uh, which led to the overthrow of President Yanukovych. Uh, he got involved in the reform processes. He uh, was a deputy uh, member, deputy um, uh, president of the board of the National Bank of uh, the Ukraine, and also for a year a minister of economic uh, development, trade, and agriculture. Uh, in basically uh, the period 2019-2020, which really had probably the most reformist uh, government in charge. Um, then now he's going back to uh, academic economics, <laughs> but I'm sure uh, follows developments uh, uh, together with also very prominent uh, economists in uh, Ukraine and abroad like Gorodnichenko or Sologub, uh, who uh, was, uh, uh, who, who, who belonged to a group of very eminent Ukrainian economists. Uh, uh, the third panelist is Olga Pindyuk from our own institute. Um, uh, she uh, is an expert on trade, uh, on trade policy modeling and trade modeling in general, especially on services trade, but is our country expert on the Ukraine and has covered other CIS countries and the CIS region in, in uh, more generally. Um, she came to us uh, a number of years ago from the Ukraine, where she worked for the World Bank office, uh, for the, uh, was a consultant to the World Bank and worked in a number of trade policy projects. Uh, Finally, I want to give my great thanks to Valerie Hopkins from the New York Times, who is resident correspondent in the New York Times in Moscow, uh, has a long uh, experience with transition, <laughs> especially in Southeast Europe initially, uh, in Bosnia, in uh, Belgrade, uh, and uh, then also in Hungary, uh, covering also Bulgaria, etc., and uh, has uh, has worked for the Financial Times and now for the New York Times. She will be moderating the discussion, so you won't hear much more from me after that. But I want to take one, uh, uh, just uh, uh, a minute to uh, also uh, use the opportunity to the memory of one of our colleagues, um, uh, engineer Peter Havlik, um, who was our Russia expert uh, and covered the CIS for many, many years. He uh, died uh, last year at the age of 70. He was with the Institute for, 42, for almost 40 years, um, deputy director for over 20 years. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we very much uh, um, uh, 
commemorate him and uh, feel in equations like this that he left a big hole uh, in at the institute. If uh, he were here, I'm sure he would actually take my role of introducing that session and would have a lot to say about that. So uh, with, with uh, that, I would like to complete the short introduction and pass uh, uh, the uh, the screen <laughs> on to Sergei uh, with his uh, introductory uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I would like to join you in commemorating Peter Fabric, who's been a great colleague, and uh, I would like to thank you for inviting me uh, to this event. Indeed, uh, I will speak for 20 minutes at most, so we have time for uh, comments by Olga and Timothy and uh, for the discussion. Um, I agree with you that we've learned a lot in those 30 years, and the uh, learning process continues. And you mentioned that mm -hmm. at the BRD, and indeed in the BRD, we always need to define what transition is, what success is, what the failure is, and we keep doing that. And in my team, in the BRD, we actually redefine again and again what successful transition is, what sustainable market economy is, and I'm happy to talk about this because also the, uh, the research I'm going to talk about has informed those changes when we introduced new transition concepts in 2016 at EBRD. Now, uh, transition has been influenced by economics, transition also influenced economics, and a lot of institutional economics research has been born exactly because of transition experience, and also political economy has been influenced by successes and failures of transition, and as you rightly said, if we learned lessons from 1990s and 2000 in um, uh, certain transition countries, we would know better how to stand up to populism in the second decade of the 21st century in, uh, in uh, various non-transition countries. And uh, I will be happy to talk more about this, but again, one, uh, one thing that I would mention regarding the BRD is that the BRD has started to work in non-post-communist countries as well, in Southern Europe, in Middle East and North Africa, exactly because certain things to learn from post-communist positions seem relevant to non-communist post -communist countries. So why does that matter? Uh, what, why do we need to learn? Uh, I will just show you this uh, very quick chart which can tell you uh, stories of three countries which came together, together, whose leaders came together 30 years ago to sign Belarus uh, Accords and to disband Soviet Union, uh, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. And uh, just show you that the uh, evolution of their GDP per capita, you can see how Russia was uh, much richer than other countries and now it's poorer than Poland. You can see that Ukraine today has the same GDP per capita as it had 30 years ago. Uh, that means that Ukraine uh, is two and a half times behind uh, Poland or almost three times behind Poland uh, while they were similar level of development. And you see that Belarus is in between. And uh, that chart itself, I'm not talking about other great failures or successes uh, in former Soviet Union or successes in, uh, uh, in, in Central Eastern Europe that would uh, populate the chart, but just these uh, few lines tell you that there is a lot to learn from those successes and failures. So uh, first and foremost, the big picture is the EU anchor really matters. I think all people in the room know that, but I would like to reiterate it, that the roadmap to join the EU and the session itself have really provided an answer for reform and for building not just economic institutions, but also sustainable political institutions. Well, in post-communist world, uh, um, there are a lot of people that we need a strong leader, we need presidential republic, we need it to, to uh, give power to the president so he and that's all the seek, right, to uh, push through the reform. What we see really is the countries that moved uh, towards European model and joined the EU and introduced democracy have actually succeeded in reforming. So this uh, initial consensus that these are unpopular reforms, so we need strong leaders, so we need to centralize power, this consensus turned out to be wrong. And today in our region, we see that countries which have introduced democratic political institutions have been more likely to push through sustainable, successful economic reform as well. Today we have a very strong correlation between quality of democratic institutions and quality of economic institutions and economic reform in particular. Why, and this is the lesson I'll be talking about today, is that in countries 
which uh, uh, did not think about inclusive reforms, didn't take into account uh, the most vulnerable parts of the population, so anti-reform backlash, and emergence of autocratic crony capitalism, where anti-reform leaders, anti-European leaders would come and say, we will restore fairness, we will restore justice. But what they did, they actually introduced crony capitalism and redistributed in favor of their friends. Now, of course, there are exceptions, but exceptions also justify the rule in a sense that you have countries like Hungary and possibly Poland that now stand up and challenge democratic values and also try to rebuild crony capitalism in a sense. But you also see how Hungarian and Polish uh, populist leaders are also constrained by European straitjacket, by European institutions, and uh, that also suggests that this reversal can still be reversed again. And in Poland, you have uh, no control by the government of the Senate, and you have big cities controlled by the opposition. In Hungary, you have a very high uh, likelihood that next thing uh, the government will change. So these things, uh, these things are not uh, easy, easy to just say Hungary is um, already uh, as bad as Russia, because it's not, and because it can go back to pro-European uh, path uh, later on. Now, uh, what I would like to say here also is uh, that if you want to learn lessons from transition, is it's not enough to look at the average GDP per capita. So if I just show you this graph, that's not sufficient. In this graph, for example, Russia has done reasonably well. Not as well as Poland, but reasonably well. Uh, but that's not enough. You really need to look at who benefited from those, um, from this average growth in GDP. And uh, it's not just enough to say on average GDP has grown pretty well. Uh, the second issue is uh, we shouldn't underestimate the improvement in well-being. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip this part altogether, but there is now a lot of research looking at things like life satisfaction and things like height. I have a paper on height showing that uh, transition was extremely tough time, which we can now measure, like paleontologists looking at height of uh, babies born during transition, they actually now are adults and they're one centimeter shorter than they should have been, which suggests that was a really, really tough time. Uh, but we also see that they are happier and we also see that people who were born after them are better educated, better um, uh, have better chances to succeed in life and so on. The pre-reform income uh, were not a good statistic for quality of life because uh, you can have rubles, but you cannot use the rubles to buy stuff in the shop. You can invest billions of rubles in a new factory, but if this factory produces something that nobody needs, uh, this is also not improving well-being. Now, um, let me actually say that uh, once, uh, uh, once Michael mentioned my paper on Gorbachev versus Deng, one thing that people don't fully understand is the late Soviet Union is also a subject we need to think about, especially when we think about what happened in the last 30 years because um, the disaster of early 1990s was actually predetermined by delaying the reform beyond the point of no, no, no salvation. People don't really know that, but um, a GDP decline in Soviet Union started well before the reform. Uh, it started to decline in 1990, in 1991. Uh, budget was unbalanced already in 1991. A different estimates give you 20% of GDP budget deficit or even 30% of GDP budget deficit. And much of that is due to the fact that late Soviet Union was not reformable. And I'm happy to elaborate on this, but what I'm saying is it's not a bug, it's a feature of that system that you have incompetent people at the top, you have very strong pro status quo lobbies, which uh, are indeed strong, and eventually they kick out Gorbachev, but they also understood that they want to stand up to reforms, want to delay reforms as much as possible. And uh, also, it's not about it, but the feature, the reform started when the party was already weak. And once you don't have enforcement, enforcement capacity, reforms like in China cannot succeed. So the delaying of the reforms predetermined the disaster for the maintenance. Now, the big uh, lesson I would uh, draw your attention to is uh, if you want to learn what uh, post-Soviet leaders did wrong, there have been a number of major mistakes. Some of these mistakes are recognized by reformers themselves, some are not. But uh, let me start with the easy one, which is um, uh, they mismanaged the expectations and they did not invest in communication. 
Now, Timothy is a practical reformer. He can tell you the story of Ukraine uh, post-dignity uh, revolution, how difficult it is to talk about reforms, uh, how difficult it is to convince the public that reforms are needed and they are in the benefit of the public, and how difficult it is uh, to uh, say, look, we have a very difficult legacy. We will not become Germany in five years. We will not become Austria in five years. You can speak in the end. And uh, reformers did not did not really understand this uh, this problem. The other thing is, of course, inclusiveness, social safety net, inequality did go up. And uh, part of that is that Poland, for example, restructured its external debt, and many Soviet countries didn't. And uh, the West also supported Poland to a greater extent than it supported Russia. Which I think is a big mistake on 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 the, on, on the side of the West, but uh, and again I can elaborate later on why that didn't happen, and I hope it will change in the next uh, round of transition. Um, so that was a very important budget constraint, especially because the reform started when oil prices went down, so uh, the countries actually lost cash. Now another thing is some reformers were corrupt. And uh, once you see that reformers are not doing the reforms for the public, uh, that immediately undermines the credibility of the reforms and empowers anti-reforms politicians who take over and actually um, actually uh, support the backlash for, uh, of reform. And that's another issue. And another challenge is indeed the whole unfairness of the process. It's not just inequality goes up. What also matters is how it goes up that you see that it's not just uh, um, people who work harder are paid more. You also see that uh, people who have connections and break the law uh, uh, make more money. And this is where you have uh, this uh, support for anti-reform politicians, and that is something that we actually saw happen. And in this case, uh, some of um, these countries suffered more than others, and Ukraine and Russia are big examples of this. When you have a resource sector, and when you have institutional change, this is a great opportunity to build huge uh, business empires. Because when you change the rules, that's the opportunity to uh, earn a lot of money on the arbitrage between all the new systems. And many of these people did that, which created uh, a lack of credibility for further reform. So you have backlash against in, in the cold concern. So this is the chart uh, I, I would like to show you. Uh, this is what we did in the DRD. Um, we tried to look at the change in income of the bottom 10%, uh, top 10%, uh, and median and average uh, um, uh, households in, uh, uh, in post-communist countries. And you see this experience has been extremely different for people at the bottom of the pyramid and at the top of the pyramid. So even mid 2000s you would ask uh, the poorest uh, post-communist residents, has transition worked for you? Uh, they would say, uh, not really. Uh, if you ask uh, the richest ones, they would say, it really worked well. And uh, this, is, this is the chart that really tells a big story of increasing inequality, but what is more important is richer becoming richer and poorer not catching up. This is different in the world. I, I will just show you a quick uh, chart, uh, which is called elephant curve. Uh, famous elephant curve by Branko Milanovic, who looked at the same question in the world. So here, on the horizontal axis, you have the global income distribution. So zero is the poorest people of the world, the 100 is top 1% of the world, uh, 50 is median citizen of the world. So these are kind of uh, upper middle class in India and, uh, and uh, uh, lower middle class in China. And on the vertical axis is the change in real income per capita in 20 years before 2008 crisis. And here you can see an elephant if you look long enough at the chart. Uh, a is top of the head of the elephant. Uh, near zero you have uh, it, its tail. And uh, B is bottom of the trunk and C is top of the trunk. And so you see that the top 1% has benefited from this 20 years of globalization. The global middle class point A has benefited a lot. But the second decile of global, uh, global um, income distribution has actually not benefited. And this is, this is the chart which shows you why people like Trump managed to uh, get support, why uh, you see uh, the rise of populism in, in, in Italy, all Italy is here. So you see that the benefits from globalization technological progress in this uh, two decades globally 
have been accrued to the rich people in rich countries and to emerging markets, but not really, for example, to uh, secondary style of global population, which is lower middle class and advanced economies, and transition countries, all transition countries as well. So why I'm showing you this graph, which is not my graph, because we build the same graph for post communist world, and you don't see an elephant here, you see a snake, if you like. Uh, you see that uh, on average, in post communist world, in the first 27 years of transition, incomes gone up by about 2% a year, in total like 50%. But the richest people have benefited more, the poorest people have benefited much less. What is also important is the first several years of transition, and this is the line below zero here, which shows the same shape, but it's below zero, which shows that the first few years were especially painful. And just to give you a country-specific chart, uh, here is a chart for Russia, where you also see the snake, which shows you that in the beginning of transition, the top 20% have benefited from transition. Uh, the rest has, has lost out a lot, and the bottom 20% have actually lost out really a lot. Now, if you look at uh, the overall um, experience of the first 27 years of transition, uh, you see that on average, Russians gained something like 70% uh, increase. But this average is a story which only applies to the top uh, 20%. Only top 20% of Russians can say my income has doubled over, the, uh, over transition. While the rest of Russians have uh, seen much uh, less impressive growth. And in that sense, we shouldn't be surprised that many Russians are so unhappy about what that happened. Now, another thing is not just the outcome that inequality has increased and the benefits accrued to the rich, it's also the process. And the process has been very corrupt, and average Russian has been very unhappy about that because they have observed that. And here I'm showing you the level of corruption uh, coming from worldwide governance indicators over time. This data started to be collected in the uh, 1990s. And you see here Poland, uh, which uh, has become more corrupt to, towards middle 2000s, then came back. So these are uh, measures where on top you have less corrupt countries, in the bottom you have more corrupt countries. And uh, zero is global average, and plus one is plus one standard deviation. So Poland now is where it should be. It's uh, not uh, more or less corrupt than a uh, normal uh, uh, high-income country. Now, Belarus uh, has become less corrupt. Uh, that's a different issue of how corruption in Belarus works. Uh, but uh, you can also see Ukraine and Russia, uh, which have been very corrupt, much more corrupt than they should have been, especially Russia, which is much richer than Ukraine. Russia is as rich as Poland, slightly behind Poland, but so much more corrupt than Poland. And of course, people knew that, and people rejected the system where not only the rich become richer, but they also become richer in a corrupt system. So um, another thing which you could see there was emergence of oligarchs. So uh, one of the things that you can look at is look at Forbes billionaire uh, list and ask yourself, which are the regions which have disproportionately many uh, billionaires? And the answer is, well, of course, in advanced economies, you have a lot of rich people, so their share in global billionaires' wealth is greater than their share in global business. That's normal. Uh, if you look at, uh, alongside emerging markets, there the picture is very clear. This is the uh, post communist region that uh, is the big champion. It has more rich people than it should. Uh, it is overrepresented in billionaires' wealth. And of course, the billionaires in the post communist region are Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs. Another characteristic in, in uh, oligarchs uh, in Russia and Ukraine is uh, the source of their wealth. If you look at other countries, for example, if you look at advanced economies, how do rich people, super rich people become rich? They invest in innovation, they invest in retail and manufacturing, finance. In post communist countries, it's all commodity. It's all uh, natural resources and regulated industry. In all other countries, developed or developing, natural resource rents are taxed. And uh, so you cannot easily become the richest person in the world by just uh, building an oil company. You can be rich, but you cannot have the situation where majority of uh, billionaires' wealth comes from natural resources. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure I should show you regression tables, but one of the things which uh, I did I tried to figure out to what extent people really care about unfairness of the process. And what I did, I measured fair and unfair inequality. Economists know that uh, you can have fair inequality where um, you make more money if you work hard and you have better education, and you can have unfair inequality 
this is part of an equality which is driven by your circumstances of birth, your race, your ethnicity, your gender, and uh, you can decompose the overall increase in inequality into fair and unfair. And basically, in transition regions, they started with unfair equality. Everybody was paid the same. Wages were compressed. So people actually were in favor of giving people who work harder, who are better motivated, who create value, to give them more money. So uh, in, in a sense, fair inequality was welcome. However, as I mentioned, uh, the one big lesson of reform was that uh, uh, was, was uh, that a lot of inequality increase was unfair. And here what I show you, I show you the data from the survey we ran uh, called Life, Life and Transition Survey uh, on the IBRD's website, where we uh, asked people, do they support market reform? In, in Russia and Ukraine, a lot of people don't, as you can imagine. And then we try to figure out to what extent it's driven by uh, the increase in fair or unfair inequality. And what we find is people who, uh, who are in the situation of unfair income inequality reject market reform. People who see a lot of fair income inequality, increase in fair income inequality, actually support market reform. And that works even if you control for their position. Income distribution, their uh, subjective self-perceived uh, um, uh, economic well-being, whatever you do, you see this simple fact that people are not against fair income inequality, but what they reject is unfair income inequality. So where we are now, and I hope we will talk about uh, more about this uh, today, is Roughly speaking, you have EU members, you have former Soviet Union, and you have uh, countries in between. The West Balkans, that's what you know, so, and the CFK countries that I mentioned, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova. You may also say Armenia is in, 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 in this uh, intermediate state. And uh, that makes it very, very interesting. Uh, how you can actually avoid those mistakes? Yeah. What do you learn from those? Uh, lessons uh, from those mistakes. And uh, uh, my takeaway is EU is a very important machine and roadmap of fashion really helps to uh, improve institutions. The second issue is pay attention to inequality, distributional outcomes, inclusiveness, social safety net, but also pay attention to fairness of the process, fight corruption, make sure that reformers are running the country not for themselves, not to enrich themselves, but uh, to benefit the, the whole society and make sure that people know that and make sure you have zero tolerance to corruption uh, within the government. And in that sense, in that sense, I think uh, um, that's already something that other countries may learn. And uh, I didn't have time to talk about Middle East and press, and but I think uh, we'll talk more about China today. I think I think there are many lessons that. Um, post Xi Jinping government uh, will have to do to uh, relaunch uh, uh, economic growth and reform in China. So let me stop here. I've been talking for 23 minutes, and uh, I'll be happy to take the questions after Olga and Timothy. Thank you so much. That was so comprehensive. I have already three pages of notes and, and a lot of follow-up questions that I want to ask. But but let's first uh, maybe turn to Olga for a response, and maybe we can also zoom in a bit on, on Ukraine and, and have that as part of the discussion. I mean, we saw the very stark graph um, there, but uh, but I will let you start, and then I will come back with, with more questions afterwards. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be participating in this discussion today. And thank you, Sergey. Your uh, lecture was very comprehensive and enlightening. And I, I mean, I fully agree with practically everything you say, uh, especially uh, you know, your points on the fairness and redistributional outcomes uh, of reforms, which are crucial, and also having strong institutional anchors, uh, such as the EU accession. That really, uh, I mean, I don't think there is any uh, debate about that. Uh, in my remarks, I would like uh, perhaps to add a few points, uh, which uh, in my opinion are also quite important uh, in understanding the more recent developments um, in the countries of former Soviet Union. In, uh, and as it was already mentioned, uh, so since I'm primarily an expert on Ukraine, I would use this country extensively for examples uh, to illustrate my point. And uh, so, I would basically have three main points to say. First, uh, that 
I think we could see a really strong divergence of democratic transformation trends in the former Soviet Union countries in the recent decade. And uh, I think it creates like, more optimism uh, for long-term positive social economic development in several countries, primarily Georgia, Armenia, and Ukraine. Um, my second point it refers to like, basically the elephant in the room, Russia. Uh, as it is really a very important factor, uh, Russia's uh, interference in other countries. Um, it impacts strongly the reforms, uh, progress, uh, and the economic uh, developments. And my third point uh, would be that, yeah, as I said already, having strong institutional anchors, it really matters. Uh, but I think second best anchors are better than nothing, and uh, they do seem to uh, provide sufficient uh, stimulus for reforms. And I, I have in mind uh, EU association agreement, uh, cooperation with the IMF. So I think uh, in the absence of strong anchors, uh, it's uh, good enough to, to look at those ones, to have those ones. And uh, since uh, you know, pictures, they're, so, uh, often better than a thousand words. I will illustrate my points with figures. And uh, the point about increasing heterogeneity in democracy levels in the last decade, I would like to use uh, the index of electoral democracy, which is collected by the VDEM uh, Institute. And uh, basically, it uh, shows uh, how uh, free uh electoral uh, process is in the countries uh, it's like a central measure of uh, democratic development and uh, i show in these graphs the development of this index uh, for selection of countries uh, armenia belarus georgia kazakhstan russia and ukraine and the vertical lines uh, i used uh, to show the so-called color revolutions because they might be important in, in interpreting uh, certain uh, results. Uh, so just to remind you, because I think it all gets blurry with the path of time. In 2003, there was a rose revolution in uh, Georgia. And uh, orange, two orange lines, they show orange revolution in 2004 in Ukraine and also Maidan, a dignity revolution, which is technically not a color revolution since it had uh, numerous casualties among protesters. Um, and uh, yeah, this actually, uh, the blue line and the gray one uh, refer to jeans revolution and snow revolution in Belarus and Russia, respectively. It was a bit surprising for me. I didn't really have any, uh, like very strong memory of, of those. And I think probably it has a lot to do with the little efficiency of them. And the last line, it was um, a recent events in Armenia, which are called Velvet Revolution. Uh, so. I mean, it's, uh, it would be uh, very premature to draw any definite conclusions from looking at the graph, but uh, we, we do observe spikes in democracy indices around uh, the events of peaceful revolutions in all the countries apart from uh, Kazakhstan and Russia. And uh, it was already mentioned, the commodity uh, sector as a key uh, sector in which rents are generated in many countries in the former Soviet Union. So I think uh, this is probably uh, the reason why, since Russia and uh, Kazakhstan, they really suffer from the so-called natural resources curse. And um, this uh, structure of the economy, it uh, allows uh, uh, to sequence in such an easy uh, and uh, fast way that uh, authoritarian power consolidates very fast and it's really not possible to shake it up with uh, any protest and uh, even stronger uh, divergence in trends you can see in the so, uh, civil society participation index development and here uh, in the end of the uh, 2020s uh, ukraine uh, georgia and armenia they had uh, levels of uh, civil society participation uh, similar to the many countries in the Western Europe and US. Uh, so in using this indicator, uh, it seems that a lot has been going on and it might be an important factor as we go to the future, uh, which might be a catalyst for some positive developments. And uh, this was 
my first point illustration and now i just would like to show you how destructive and uh, this detrimental russia's factor can be so this figure it's very simple one it shows how uh, ukrainian economy was affected in the aftermath of 2014 events uh, it was crimea annexation and the be uh, beginning of military escalation in donbass region and uh, it caused immediately a huge recession in the country and uh, i mean it's pretty straightforward to, to say that uh, if you have such external uh, factors influencing your economy it might be impossible to achieve any meaningful success with your reforms whatever you do if you have uh, invasion annexation and uh, military conflict this impacts directly investment climate in a country and uh, its investment is crucial for many transition and for practically every transition economy in order to innovate the infrastructure adopt new technologies without having this uh, countries do not really have a shot uh, for prosperity and my third point was about uh, not having a really good anchors for reforms uh, but uh, still some are there and uh, i uh, use uh, here a reform index uh, which is calculated by vox ukraine which was already mentioned by you, Michael, in the uh, introduction. And uh, it shows how reforms uh, were advancing starting from 2015. And uh, the index can take uh, values from minus five to five. Basically, if it's in a positive range, it means that there are some reforms going on, but the index value has to be higher than two in order for the reform uh, pro uh, process to be considered fast so it was practically never fast uh, uh, according to this index in the last six years however it was uh, mostly with one exception in the positive uh, terrain so the reforms are co uh, continuing and of course slower than necessary but uh, still something and uh, talking about the eu accession as an anchor actually uh, i found it quite surprising uh, that sometimes uh, it seems it might turn out to be not sufficiently strong for democracy preservation. I again use the same index of electoral democracy for 2019 and uh, I show cross-section values for a range of countries. Uh, so in the left side there are former Soviet Union countries and then there is a couple of Western Balkans because uh, indexes uh, coverage is a bit uh, not very good there and uh, Central Eastern European countries. And actually, it's, I found it quite striking uh, that uh, Hungary in 2019 had lower uh, value of the index of electoral democracy uh, than uh, Ukraine, Armenia, Georgia. Uh, so what does it mean for the future, whether it still can be, uh, this reversal can be reversed, it remains to be seen. Uh, but I, I think uh, it, for sure it points to the importance of other factors, which are probably not included in the equation when we talk about the uh, process. And to end on somewhat like more optimistic note, uh, yes, the Russia factor makes reform progress much more difficult in uh, many countries of the former Soviet Union, primarily Ukraine, which is now uh, all over in the news. Uh, there's a high risk of military escalation uh, but at least uh, there is a change in economic structure which makes dependency on Russian economy uh, lower and it uh, allows at least, uh, if not politically, but economically to move away from the Russian orbit. And here I just show how the uh, trade, uh, uh, merchandise trade structure of Ukraine changed uh, starting from 2010 to 2019. And uh, 2010, Russia accounted for a really high, significant share of both exports and imports. And uh, in 2019, it was uh, practically uh, uh, well, it's approaching zero. It's not there yet, but it became less uh, significant in China. And uh, there are also uh, are there structural changes going on, in particular increasing the services uh, sector, uh, digitally delivered services sector, Ukrainian software industry becomes quite successful on a global scale. Uh, 
So hopefully there will be enough positive developments on the economy level to facilitate and promote reforms. Um, that's all on my part. Thank you. So much. Let's uh, turn it over to you, Timofey, to to make your final presentation before we we kind of have a more robust discussion. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I have one slide and um, or two or three, and uh, I want to make a couple of points which complement um, what um, my colleagues and friends on this panel have been discussing. Uh, what's on this picture? In this picture, there are protests uh, in front of the National Bank of Ukraine about uh, reforms, banking reform in 2014, 2015. And in many ways, one can say that this was an unfair reform. Also, it, it's not a long lasting effect, but many companies got bankrupt, many people got fired, fired lost jobs uh, for macroeconomic reasons. But out of 180 banks, we have 90 banks shut down by the regulator. And a lot of people lost money. And then reformers who were doing that, who were doing the cleanup of the banking system, these reformers, many of them, you know, are either out of the government or wars in exile. Some of them had their houses burned and couldn't return to the country. At the same time, so you can say that this is a poster child where people were really upset about these reforms. And uh, some of the vested interests were really upset about these reforms. And yet somehow today in Ukraine, when you talk about reforms which are sustainable, this is one of the most sustainable, maybe even the only sustainable reform. Because many of the other reforms, structural reforms, are being constantly challenged. But here, you, despite the political process, you, you have independent central bank. There is always pressures, you know, but relatively speaking to many other countries, developing countries or de even developed countries, you have macroeconomic stability. In the history of Ukraine, that's the first time that during pandemic, we didn't have macroeconomic instability. We didn't have a major financial crisis triggered by external conditions. And um, politicians are afraid to talk about printing money or financing and you know, the budget process is more or less disciplined. I'm bringing this example to demonstrate that even though a lot of people consider this reform, almost all stakeholders inside the country consider this reform to be bad. It's sustainable. And this is paradoxical. And then here is the Central Banking Award of 2019 of the National Bank of Ukraine. It's the best central bank in the world. It gets awards now. All right, so so uh, as transparent as the most transparent central bank in, in the world. So I'm challenging or I'm complementing to the idea that you can, you know, I'm demonstrating you can have unfair reforms, which are very painful. And yet they are sustainable. Of course, you have many unfair reforms. Let's say you take privatization in Ukraine and privatization in Ukraine, uh, oligarchs were created. So it's almost impossible to get public support for any privatization today in Ukraine. And in fact, there is a backlash of political pressure coming from the public to have larger role for the government to regulate the economy. So the market or pro-market sentiment is not as strong exactly because um, privatization didn't work very well in the 90s. And then, the, and then the central bank is just the opposite story. It really a lot of families got their income destroyed, uh, jobs were destroyed, and yet right now you can. So the point I'm, I want to make, it's about narrative. It's about putting on the national political agenda a frame so that the reform or sustainability of the reform is associated with well-being of people going forward. Even if the reform is perceived as being unfair and done by bad people. In Ukraine right now, people understand very well that if you start 
printing money or you start doing something else, we're going to have to experience this again. So there will be even more unfairness or there will be even more problems. And that's because the reform has been simply put on the political agenda. And right now, if I talk about inflation, it goes on TV in no time. At the same time, you take the energy market and the energy market and reforms in the energy markets have been as painful. But we're nowhere to be done with the energy market in Ukraine. And this is because it has not been transparent to the political agenda and to the people, the cost that we have paid to bail out the energy markets, what the taxpayers have paid. And taxpayers have paid it. So when we bailed out Privat Bank, well, that was a major bank owned by an oligarch, uh, which was bailed out, you know, the government paid about $5 billion to bail it out. And you can read in the news, international news about prosecution and indictments in the US and court cases in London against uh, these uh, former owners of the bank. You know, that was all public. When we are talking about bailout of state-owned companies in approximately the same amount of money, nafta gas, it's like gas prompt for Ukraine. And it was done in 2014, 2015. That's not in the news. I know it because I was on the council on the board of the National Bank, so I know the state bailed out, the National Bank bailed out, but people do not understand the cost of this. They really don't understand the cost, therefore no one is too concerned about the future of the energy markets. So in my view is, in order to understand which reforms are sustainable and which are not, we need to understand the, which ones of them have become national agenda political issues and which are not. Right now in Ukraine, we are talking about that we, we have achieved macroeconomic stability, but now we need to have private market growth to get Ukraine on the growth path. We are stable, we have democracy, but we are not growing. That's a challenge. So we need private sector to grow. This is not happening because it's just not on the agenda. It doesn't concern people in any way. We can't, we can't get it as reformers. We cannot get it on the national agenda, private growth. So that's one, one main point that I would, uh, I think narrative uh, sometimes rather than the distribution, or I wouldn't, you know, you, they're not opposed to each other, but they complement each other. And we understand very little about how reforms get captured by politicians and used for political narratives. And once we understand that, and I've seen how it's designed from inside, we get a structural understanding of which reforms are happening and why and which reforms are not happening or which are not sustainable. Most of the reforms in Ukraine, they're not sustainable, haven't been sustainable. We have tried judicial reform five times, this judicial reform number five. They get reversed, so we need to understand what's going on. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about it, but I think the uh, really simple story is that you need to do it bottom up. So if you do reform of courts, you shouldn't go from the top courts down. You should fix a lower court that people understand what's happening. If you do a banking reform, you fix first smaller banks. That's what was done in Ukraine. Then you go for the large bank. Because if you go for the large bank first to clean it up, the vested interest could control the narrative, will frame it. Establish the background, establish uh, understanding among people what you are doing, and then move up. And the problem, I think, with all reforms that they are, they are designed in a very grandiose, grand manner. The IMF comes in or a new president comes in or a new prime minister and says, let's change everything. Let's do judicial reform. Let's change the Supreme Court, the Constitutional Court. Let's establish top courts. It looks good on the agenda, but it disconnects with the public. The public doesn't understand what's the point of the Supreme Court reform. It looks good, but they don't understand what it really means for them. If you fix a law of court in a local village and it will re improve redistributional justice or reverse some of the unfairness, then you will get much more buy-in from the public. And then the democratic and political mechanism will work and make reform sustainable and will have multipliers in certain ways. So that's one point I want to make. The second one is a pretty controversial point I want to make about the effect of Russia. If you look, and I think, you know, I don't, since I've been in the politics and I continue to serve as an advisor to the office of the president and serve on some boards, I have to be really, really careful. This is just a hypothesis. 
that what happens is that when Russia escalates, it reduces political infighting inside Ukraine. And if you looked at structural reforms which are done, they are done after some kind of major events, such as uh, a revolution or an invasion or something else. This is when you destroy a status quo and open up political space for major changes. So in, in other words, things have to get bad before they can become better. You need to generate political space for reforms to happen, for unpleasant reforms to happen. And that political space gets generated only if there is an external pressure enemy or issue. It could be a macro crisis, it could be a Russian invasion, or it could be some other, you know, it could be COVID. And that would generate political space. It's very counterintuitive because presumably you want to do reforms, unpopular reforms, when you have fiscal space, when you have macroeconomic space, when the, you know, when there is growth and you can redistribute and pay off uh, people who can suffer from the you know, changing of the status quo. But in practice, political constraints turn out in these countries, in countries like Ukraine, to be more important than economic constraints or surplus constraints. And you generate political space for structural reform, not by having surplus to pay out uh, losers from the reform or people who will, will suffer from the reform and, uh, by, uh, and creating political rents for coalition building, Rather when you get, it's not the carrot which works, it's the stick. That, that's what Sergei said somewhere on the slide was very deep, I think, the point. Lack of understanding of unsustainability of the status quo. It's difficult to model, it's almost behavioral economics. People don't understand that the status quo is not sustainable. And you need a major shock to the system to demonstrate and prove it to the politicians that the status quo can't exist or can't persist anymore. So you have to change. So I would put the political space constraints on the first place for reforms and the economic or the, our most standard way of thinking about coalition formation and rent pay, pay, payouts as the secondary. Okay, this is the second point I, will do, uh, I would like to make. And I have the third one. The third one is that democracy has to be earned. It cannot be imposed. And that's true for all institutions. Because if you just impose institutions, like given a good car, I'm gonna use a very simplistic example, but people don't know how to drive it. But they have, they have been driving bad cars, they have learned how to manage them and they're given a good car, they value it, they defend it and they know how to use it. Because what happens when we build good institutions in Ukraine, but the civil society, the expert community is either not there or and polit politicians or don't understand how the new institutions operate. These new institutions immediately get captured by the same vested interests which were present prior to it. And so that becomes a facade. You know, we all remember that in the Soviet Union, there were democratic elections and there were always a candidate and everyone voted for them. So a lot of new institutions which are being built up in Ukraine, they look like that. On the paper, they are great. In practice, they don't work. And the true institution, it's like the difference between uh, real and formal authority, real and formal institutions. Often real institutions, they're also, I'm making the same point, they're bottom up. They have to be earned, they have to be created by the public rather than imposed by, even by the government, okay? So these are three points I would like to make, uh, and I hope they contribute to the perspective on the microstructural institutional level. And again, I'm a game theorist. I'm a person who looks at the micro side. Thank you. Uh, we only have half an hour left, so I want to encourage people to, to start dropping their questions in. But I have a few questions, and I actually wanted to start uh, from you, Timofey, because um, Ukraine recently in the past few months uh, has instituted two fairly large, fairly, I mean, what what to purport to be, if, if, I, if I can trust the media coverage, um, uh, in consequential reforms. One of them is the land reform, which uh, when I was in Kiev this summer, everybody said, this is 
finally, you know, after 30 years of the end of the Soviet Union, this will be finally the end of the Soviet legacy. And also this oligarch bill that uh, President Zelensky signed at the beginning of November. I wonder if you could just briefly kind of acquaint our viewers uh, with both of those reforms and, and kind of how you assess their real uh, prospects for, for, for bringing change. Thank you. The land market reform, that was a, the reform that I'm very proud of. I was the minister who, I was the minister of economy, international trade and land market or agriculture. The ministers were joined, minister of agriculture and economy. And two weeks into my office, I submitted um, the package to the to the cabinet and the procedure would be that the cabinet would pass it and then the parliament would have to pass it and so on and so forth. And I remember these discussions that uh, people were, again, vested interests were explicitly challenging saying that you won't even be able to pass it at the cabinet level, let alone at the parliament level. And to give a context, there has been a moratorium on land market reform for 20 years. So we have been able to change that. What are the what are the structures? What are the lessons learned which are positive and what are the lessons learned which are negative? The positive one is, of course, we didn't write the law in two weeks. The law was ready. OK, and the new government needed a quick win and that win had to look serious. So that's a hook when you do a structural reform in terms of pragmatics, technology of doing structural reforms. You have to always have to be ready to like hand ready that you can submit to the parliament immediately a package of structural reforms. They have to be prepared in advance. That happened almost with all structural reforms which have been successful. For example, decentralization reform in Ukraine. It was actually the legislation was written during Yanukovych times, not during Poroshenko. It's when Groisman became a prime minister, he needed a win, he picked one and then he passed it through. So that's, at, uh, that's stage number one, a hook how you bring the structural reform in. Stage number two, how, the, how it survives the parliament and then the implementation stage, because it's being sabotaged everywhere. So at that point, you need to con con commit um, it to the credibility of the top leadership of the country. So that's the top leadership of the country was new I mean, the prime minister and the president, they were in the office shortly, so they needed to establish credibility and authority. And we were pushing it everywhere by saying, if you want to check one thing, you know, in the end of the day, if the land market reform gets through, it's been 20 years of moratorium. If we can get the market of land through, that means we are different. That means we get things done. That differentiates us from everyone else who have not been, even Poroshenko have been unable to touch the land market reform. He has done everything. He rebuilt military. He has done, you know, structural reforms, cleaned up the banking sector. He couldn't do market, land market. We could. So that you have to hook it and then you have to connect it to the credibility of the biggest coalition. If you achieve those two things, they will get through. Uh, now, was it uh, cut down in the sense that this is a really slow reform? I, I wanted it to be a really pro-market, no restrictions. Now it's going to be in stages and it's probably be in the version of what I wanted 10 years from now instead of one year from now. Yes. But that comes to sustainability. People are worried that it is like privatization and it will be abused by those in power. And endogenously the design of the reform has been amended to slowly demonstrate it's almost like in theory bayesian persuasion you have to credibly demonstrate to people that you don't create a major redistribution in the market that's why the reform is slow so this is three ingredients for any reform to happen all right on the oligarchization i would have done if i were to do i'm a structural guy so I would do competition authority. I would strengthen the competition authority. And I think that's the next st fundamental structural reform for Ukraine, where you need to have strong competition authority, which is as strong, let's say, in real sector as the central bank was in financial sectors in Ukraine. But the electricization bill is more shortcut. What it does, it puts on political agenda, it changes the landscape. It says oligarchs are not untouchable anymore. This is really a big deal because no one 
challenge that status quo. So what Zelen you can say a lot of bad things about Zelensky and you can say a lot of good things about Zelensky. And obviously I have some selection bias because I'm in his team, but I think he has challenged quite successfully the status quo. And the organization bill is one example of that. Now, what it will come out to, I think in the next uh, 10 years, it will be competition authority reform and it will be energy market cleanup because that's where the olig uh, oligarchs are keeping their rents at this point. And that's going to happen. The question is how fast in the next political cycle, in this political cycle, in the two or three political cycles. But basically, land market is going to be done. Uh, the oligarchization is just the beginning of the uphill battle and it could go either way at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, ah, there's so many different directions that I want to go in, but but one big burning question on my mind, and maybe I can sort of um, add this on to Anurada's question about um, Russia's place among these countries. Um, I'm really interested, you know, we've spoken a lot about the uh, increase now in tensions uh, between Russia and Ukraine. There's about 100,000 troops, uh, according to US intelligence and Ukrainian intelligence massing on the border. And, you know, the US and the EU have threatened uh, quite serious uh, punishment sanctions um, on Russia. And I'm really curious, actually, for, for your view, Dr. Gudiev, how sanctions proof is Russia's economy at this point? How how much easier will it be able to weather kind of another round of more intense sanctions? Depending on Thank you, Valeria. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, yes, I think I think uh, Russian economy is both uh, sanction proof and uh, really vulnerable. And uh, you know, it's never it's never a bad idea to repeat the call job about President Yeltsin to talk to a British uh, Prime Minister um, about the state of the Russian economy. The British Prime Minister, John Major, asked uh, President Yeltsin uh, to characterize the state of Russian economy in one word, and President Yeltsin said, good. And then uh, John Major asked to characterize in two words, being unhappy about this, such a brief characterization. So President Yeltsin said, not good. And so I think it's exactly how Russian economy fares right now. It does have huge reserves, and um, it does have balance budget. Uh, it does have central bank, which has been reformed and uh, is pretty much in control of inflation. Inflation is high everywhere these days, but central bank, if it wants to, will bring it down if needed. And in that sense, macroeconomic framework is stable, but it's a bit like uh, what Timothy uh, uh, mentioned uh, regarding Ukraine. Growth is not there, and what limits growth is of course internal corruption, but also the isolation of Russia from the rest of the world. And sanctions today remove any hope that Russia will suddenly accelerate its economic growth. Doesn't mean that Russia will have a market economic collapse, no. But it means that uh, incomes will not grow and Russia will become unhappier and unhappier every day. Now, I would remind you that President Putin has high popularity approval ratings today. Yeah, they're much lower than they used to be. Uh, the recent uh, poll asked uh, Russians if they vote, if they would, would like to vote for Mr. Putin if presidential elections happened today. And so 32% said we would vote for Mr. Putin. That's much lower than half a year ago, which was 40, two years ago when it was 50. So it's, uh, it's, uh, President Putin is not doing well, and he would love to see investment, growth. It's not happening. And this is where sanctions hit. But this is a slow process. Now, what President Putin is also afraid of is sanctions not against the Russian economy, but against his own friends. And that is what, is what he's very, very unhappy about. And this is where the West can hit. And um, uh, if the West uh, targets specific big companies, specific banks, that can be very, very painful for uh, Mr. Putin himself, because eventually it's not, uh, it's not a tension year in um, Siberia who will overthrow Mr. Putin. Uh, either there is a big process or there are people around Mr. Putin who will be so unhappy that Mr. Putin will have to feel unsafe. Too many authoritarian leaders were killed by their very close friends and chiefs of security because they were feeling unhappy uh, about their own future. And in that sense, uh, Mr. Putin is very worried about sanctions. And uh, when people think that 
uh, the West doesn't have to leverage over Russian government. I think they forget about how dependent Russian elites are on the West still today, despite all the strong macroeconomic fundamentals, despite all the foreign currency reserve, uh, sovereign wealth fund and balance budget. Now, I think, I think it's still, it's still a situation where the Russian government is really, really unhappy about even the talk about future sanctions. Olga, I wanted to come up to you and, and ask you to respond to, to, to some of the comments we've already heard. And maybe also you can address this question, question from uh, Gunther Rosenitz from the Austrian Peace Academy about uh, uh, kind of connecting Ukraine and, and the US um, and this uh, uh, impression that uh, Ukraine is being sold to the US and the EU is, is being left behind. Um, and how you rate the U.S.-Ukrainian economic agreements and the expanded defense space cooperation. And I also wanted to add to that, I was so struck by the graph that you had about the levels of corruption or the, 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 in Russia and Ukraine being almost the same, considering all of these kind of incentives that, that, that you spoke about, IMF, relationship with EU, you know, Euro-Atlantic aspirations. And like, what else can there be actually to, to that as an incentive structure to 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 make those corruption levels not on the same level as Russian anymore. Sorry, that's like three questions, but yeah, it's it's, it's a lot. Yes. Uh, but, but regarding the U.S. Uh, Ukraine uh, relations, I mean, I do not see it uh, as selling out. I think, uh, I mean, it's a very subjective way to to frame it like that. Um, Basically, there is Washington consensus, and there are signatures, uh, signatories of uh, of it, which uh, took responsibility of providing, uh, you know, certain guarantees to Ukraine when it's uh, when it had when it agreed to get uh, get rid of its nuclear arsenal. Yeah, so. I think uh, probably what's uh, going on is that the U.S. Uh, uh, feels its obligations somewhat stronger than the EU at the moment. I would put it like that, and uh, it acts a bit more actively in trying to uh, assure. I mean, to to actually provide its guarantees uh, to Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty. And uh, when it comes to US, e Ukraine, EU relations in this respect, I think, uh, I mean, economic turbulence uh, starting with the global financial crisis and the recent COVID pandemic, which also didn't affect uh, economies of the EU in a good way, um, they shifted uh, the primary focus of politics here. But from what I could follow, uh, the intelligence uh, on the Russian actions uh, in the recent past is so convincing uh, then uh, that uh, the EU and most importantly Germany is on board in terms of uh, protecting Ukraine's interests and uh, uh, joining on the sanctions, uh, which could now include Nord Stream 2 uh, shutting down. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's as far as I can talk about this. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the actions are not uh, strong enough on the side of the West, uh, but uh, there is always some, you know, geopolitical, real political considerations, that, and that's what we have in the end. And uh, in terms of corruption, uh, well, it's basically a legacy thing. As soon as we end up in certain equilibrium, it takes very strong uh, uh, shocks from outside to uh, to shift it, and I actually fully agree with uh, Timofey that uh, you know crises uh, they uh, are a blessing in disguise in some way that they actually make a willingness for reforms there. So, but it hasn't been uh, powerful enough. The institutional anchors such as the association agreement with the EU, IMF cooperation, uh, which has never been fully successful till now um, it has never been strong enough to really offset uh, the initial damage done by the unfair uh, privatization and uh, you know the, uh, the the way 
these shock reforms were conducted at the beginning. So that's when the oligarchy was created and uh, there are these vested interests and to remove them, to, to um, disintegrate them or diminish their impact, um, it's not so easy as experience shows. I think briefly that's it. Thank you so much. I go to Timofey very quickly to add uh, and comment something on corruption, and then I will go to Michael to ask uh, a question to Sergei because we are already 15 minutes so, left. Corruption is misunderstood. Um, there is a notion, you know, I think of this as there is Darwinism and there is religion. Religion says it's good to have zero corruption. Darwinism says, well, you know, there is corruption, there are reasons for corruption, and you can only get out of it evolutionary. So in, Ukraine has done a lot of institutional reforms to fight corruption. And, uh, you know, mixed success. No one is asking a question, the question, why there is corruption. We just want to fight it. We say that it's bad, but we're not asking why it's there. And it's really a vehicle of political financing. And on top of that, it's non-transparent non and people get uh, rich and this is really bad. It's very disturbing, but it's fundamentally, first of all, it's a vehicle of political financing. So until political financing is legalized, fighting corruption in these countries is going to be very, very difficult. Not impossible, but challenging. The second one is that you really need to build capital markets. Because the sources, why the rents from political financing are so much higher in Ukraine that they are sometimes uh, than they are in, let's say, the United States. When Ukrainian corrupt politicians read about the bribe of $5 million in Chicago, you know, uh, for a seat or something, they laugh because that's nothing. Why is that? Well, that's because the oligarchs are protecting their wealth through the parliament. They really need to buy these votes. And so the value, some of this value is captured by the limited number of politicians who have been voted into the parliament. And the value of protection oligarch wealth is really, really high. So unless you create an alternative mechanism for them, such as a capital market where they can invest and disconnect from the real side of the economy, we will be facing huge rents on the offer side in the parliament and the executive which would be impossible to overcome or compete with by any legal salaries. Thank you. Wow, I wish we could dig deeper into that. And I, I also wish we could do this panel for 30 years in the future to look at how the energy <laughs> transition is going to affect uh, this region and especially Ukraine and Russia. But we also need to find out about lessons that other countries are learning. So I turn it over to you, Michael, to, to ask your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, it's a bit provocatively formulated, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, Sergei, I, I was thinking whether President Xi is one of your most careful readers of your <laughs> framework and uh, approach. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, I think uh, at least in some of the writings you say the the importance of state capacity. Yeah, and uh, the question I have is to some extent where does this uh, state capacity come from? Yeah. Uh, which would not turn just into detrimental form of state capacity here. Yeah? So in China, there's obviously a very uh, well-functioning or a party structure there, which holds up an alternative um, uh, pillar of state capacity, which uh, has uh, disappeared basically in many of the other countries here, yeah? ideologically with some anchorage in society, etc. Here, yeah? uh, he also probably read your <laughs> pieces quite well that distribution matters, yeah, and therefore the newer campaigns, at least rhetorically, but even in real terms, in terms of regional inequalities, it was taken seriously here, yeah? including extension of safety nets, uh, etc. On, uh, he's, uh, China, as we know, is not burdened by natural resource curse, yeah? And uh, the thing you manage, uh, you, you, uh, you basically push very strongly is getting out of a medium income trap is to move towards innovation, etc. Yeah, again, another big aim. So <laughs> overall, I, I feel 
he of course can't control necessarily the external environment fully, although he uh, he, he uh, has some impact on it. Yeah, but some of the uh, disentanglement from uh, world economic integration with Chinese experience is not just of its own making here. Yeah? So I just wonder how how you react to um, uh, the implementation of, to some extent, some components of your programs as it develops in China. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, this is a question for another two hours. Uh, uh, the good news is, indeed, you mentioned uh, our book coming up in Princeton University Press. My publisher said, wherever I talk, I need to mention this book. And thank you very much. You mentioned that we do pay a lot of attention to China. China is not one of our in dictators. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting new breed of dictators, which we don't really discuss in the book. But China has done uh, several things right, as you rightly said. However, we may now observe China first getting into middle income trap and second building a Putinist regime, if you like. Uh, so China, after Mao, was uh, not a democratic country, but it did invest in state capacity and it did introduce several uh, mechanisms borrowed from democratic countries. Regularization, meritocracy. Uh, whenever you run your province better, you are more likely to be promoted. Now, uh, how do you get a vacancy to get promoted to? That's because every 10 years, the top player retires, right? And people would say, why and how in a dictatorial country, uh, the top person stands down. Putin doesn't want to stand down, right? And uh, people would say, well, that's because they remember the problems of Mao's government, which is dangerous for Mao's lieutenant and for Chinese economy on average, right? And so you would think that uh, when the memory of Mao fades away, there will be a strong leader who will try to capture the, uh, uh, the uh, reign. And that's what we observe. Then another issue that you mentioned, uh, people dislike corruption, people dislike inequality. And this is what the agenda of Mr. G is exactly focused on. And we see that he's actually succeeding. He puts people in jail for corruption, not his people, right? There is research which shows that people who studied and worked with Mr. G are not in jail. Uh, zero people connected to Mr. G are in jail, right? Uh, and then also inequality. There is research now, and there is a paper by the famous Samati Kati, which came out in American Economic Review on Chinese inequality. Chinese inequality is now federalized and going down, which is, again, an achievement of Mr. G. And, and uh, then, however, he also is breaking down the system of meritocracy because he paid this loyalty as a personality dictator. He also is breaking down the system of regular rotation because he wants to stand, uh, to, not to step down, to uh, run the country forever. That creates a dimension. And this is coming at a very uh, difficult moment for Chinese economy because it's now in the middle income trap. It needs to build new industries for which China needs innovation, needs openness, needs new markets. And then instead of doing that, the government, Mr. Chi's, uh, Chi's, um, Chi's uh, uh, personality government, cracks down on competing centers of power, which is private sector, uh, the top entrepreneur, and also tries to distract Chinese uh, attention to the outside. Like Mr. Putin and Axis neighboring countries' territories, um, uh, Xi Jinping talks about Taiwan a lot, Xi Jinping talks about Belt and Road initiative, sends up to the West in many locations, which is good for domestic revenue, sure, but it's not good for Chinese economy, as you said. So you can see how and why Chinese growth is slowing down. This is not bark, it's a feature of the system where you see the rise of personalistic regime, which loses the element which drove Chinese economic miracle in the last 40 years. And so we should all be worried about this. Just one statistic I would like to give you. Uh, in Russia, as Bulgakov said, the housing issue has corrupted the Moscovite. Right? The housing issue is a big, big problem here. And Russia is still uh, way behind Western Europe and especially the United States in terms of square meters per capita. So in Russia, there is a great opportunity to build square meters like in Ukraine and Belarus. In China, this is actually no longer so. China has already built so many square meters. So China is at the level of uh, Central Europe and actually Spain. It's the head of Spain in terms of square meters per capita. That means construction miracle is no longer going to continue. Construction and real estate account for 25% of Chinese GDP. So Evergrande bankruptcy is just a harbinger of what's going to come. And so China is facing difficult challenges. And you want good governance. And Mr. Xi is, of course, creating 
a system which is too rigid, too top-down, and I think we should all worry about China. Now, looking at Putin, we should also worry about Taiwan, right? Once your economic growth runs out of steam, you look for other sources of legitimacy, and you look around what you can do to make you look uh, front leader. And I think we should all worry about Chinese neighboring countries, China's neighboring countries. Warning and, and clarion call. Um, I guess we have time maybe for one or maybe even two very quick questions. Um, we have one, one from Tobias that sort of follows on with this a bit that maybe I can post to you, Olga, about reforms in an autocratic context. For instance, uh, Uzbekistan's current ambitions versus the status quo. And in the form of Soviet Union context, how much of an impact, if any, can this kind of partial economic reforms have without establishing meaning uh, democratic checks and balances? I do not really follow Uzbekistan closely, but from my understanding of the region, Kazakhstan would be like uh, the closest approximation of a benevolent dictatorship, uh, kind of, because they have never had really any kind of democracy there. But nonetheless, uh, the government was always uh, trying to play the cards as, uh, in terms of redistributive outcome as nice as possible. So it can bring you so as far as it can, uh, as it brought Kazakhstan in terms of uh, you know GDP per capita. They I think outperform Russia. Uh, yeah, they're blessed with natural resources. That's a big part of the equation. But uh, I don't think any sustainable economic uh, growth is possible in this constellation. Uh, and I don't think you can find any example in history where. It would go, would it go otherwise. Mm -hmm. I to Sergei um, out um, how you how you reassess the normal countries thesis put forward by your book partner um, Daniel Treisman in 2014. Is there a new normal at all, or is the post-Soviet region so diverse that even the category post-Soviet is losing relevance? So this is a favorite topic of the regional watchers. Right. Uh, first on the post-Soviet thing, I think uh, as long as you exclude the uh, Baltic countries from former Soviet Union, the rest of Soviet Union is still, uh, as uh, Leo Tolstoy would say, unhappy in its own way. Every uh, post-Soviet country is unhappy in its own way. All European members are happy in the same way. Baltic countries, Czech Republic, Slovenia are all happy in the same way. All uh, uh, post-Soviet countries are unhappy in their own way. Uh, and uh, in all countries, you can tell the stories that we've been sharing. And of course, you still have Uzbekistan or Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, which are different from Georgia and Armenia. But still, I think there are many issues which are still common. And one of them is, of course, uh, lack of functioning democratic institutions, which are key for economic reform. And uh, we can talk about the success of Uzbekistan uh, reform, but Still, it's not, it's not sustainable. And uh, I think one example of autocratic reforms is Belarus, which I showed to you, which has been stagnated for 10 years, because Russia has been stagnated for 10 years and could not any longer sustain the, the huge subsidies to Belarus, which were going in the range of 10% of GDP per year. So Belarus looks like it's an oil importer, but it's actually an oil country. It's an oil rich country because it finds uh, oil and gas at a subsidized price from Russia, refines it and sells it at a market price to the rest of the world. So it looks like it's a, uh, it's a country which imports oil, but that's an oil rich country like Russia because of this um, subsidy. Um, so Belarus is not an economic miracle and Uzbekistan is yet not an economic miracle as well. Now going uh, back to the normal country features, I actually think that uh, the big problem here is the uh, connotation of normal. In uh, Russian language, normal means good. And uh, that tells you a bit of uh, Russian history, right? That to get to the norm would be a great goal, per se. But in, in uh, English, normal means okay, uh, not outstanding. And in that sense, uh, in that sense, uh, um, Trisman Slifer argument stands. Now, let me tell you two 
dimensions in which Russia is not normal. Russia is abnormally corrupt, as I already mentioned. So Russia is a middle-income country, at some point almost a high-income country, by the one standard deviation more corrupt than it should be. Right? So that's a huge, huge gap. So Russia is as corrupt as many poor Sub-Saharan African countries and Ukraine, um, which is much poorer. Right? And the other thing where Russia is better than normal, than normal is uh, education. Russia is much better educated than a country at this level of development. And Ukraine, of course, has the same feature. Right? For Ukraine, it's even uh, the difference is even starker. But Russia is one of the best educated countries in the world still. Yeah. And in that sense, uh, these two things may balance each other. They may also tell you the story of Russia's future. Either Russia remains under this uh, French uh, uh, regime of Mr. Putin, corruption persists, education gets uh, destroyed, people leave, brain drain undermines this human capital advantage, and Russia becomes a normal, corrupt, middle-income country and uh, falls behind uh, other emerging markets. Or uh, regime somehow reforms itself or gets replaced, corruption is being kicked out, and so the benefits of high human capital will make Russia a successful country like Czech Republic or Poland, for that, for that matter. So there are normalities and there are also abnormalities. Um, another few hours um i hope that we'll have some more panels for an opportunity to do that timothy i wanted to give you a chance to to respond to anything very quickly or to make some kind of concluding remarks but i know that we are already actually over the the time so just if you wanted to say something quickly or if you wanted to answer denise's question about Nord stream 2 uh how it would affect ukraine and then quickly we can wrap up i hope it's okay michael to yeah, take uh, thank you i i think we have spoken about a lot of things and uh, again there are two Two, two perspectives complementary, one is macro and the other one is structural at the micro level and both are needed to be understood. Narratives are critically important because we, and we don't understand them enough uh, because that's how politicians have become very, very good at shaping and strategizing at narratives. Now on specific on Nord Stream 2, I think um, this is an important and critical issue for us, uh, but uh, mostly the, I, I, Economically, yes, it's unpleasant. It's it's costly, uh, but it's just two billion dollars. You know, our IT or three billion dollars. Our IT grew up, you know, from two hundred million dollars in five billion dollars expert over the several years. So you know, uh, we can do much more if we focus on growth, you know, rather than on the legacy infrastructure issues. There is a technological issue which I'm less informed in. So what happens if the pressure stops from this? What do we do? How expensive it will be for us to rearrange this the entire system? And that might be critical. So, but that I'm not informed about it. But uh, I, I agree with Sergey and corruption as the you know as the something which destroys the potential of the country to actually build up. I think that's also misunderstood when we talk about corruption, how big of this issue is. But not in the sense that politicians are being paid some of them, but in the sense that it disrupts the entire system and what it does to ethics and uh, kind of leadership. And so, so the last, uh, the last one, one thing I, I always wanted to say during today and never had an opportunity. I think we, we have the culture of pretense. What we, what we write in uh, constitutions in this country doesn't get you know, in, even in Ukraine, which is a democracy, it's written that we have free education and free healthcare. We don't. We can't expect courts and judicial system and no corruption if even our constitution is not brave enough to acknowledge issues we have. So I think that's critical. And that's, you know, all these countries have kind of double standards and that takes away and steals ethics and strengths from people who want to change things. Uh, I don't know, we don't talk about this issue, but I, again, maybe it's not economics issue, but that's what I would like to finish with. Thank you and sorry for abusing the opportunity. I think that was quite inspiring. Um, I'm Thank you very much for, for asking me to moderate this discussion. It's been very fascinating and interesting. I hope everybody enjoyed and 
I'm sure there will be uh, many, many follow-ups to come on, on lots of these issues. So thank you very much also to all of you who uh, stayed and watched for this hour and a half. Thank <laughs> you.